Dragons have always been a massive part of Souls games. Some offer a perfect boss fight and some are just extremely annoying. So let's talk about these overgrown lizards and explore the best ones today. For each dragon, I will summarize their lore a little bit and then I will talk about their boss fights. If you enjoy this type of content, give a like and comment below your favorite dragons or I will personally ask Miyazaki to delay Shadow of the Earth 3. Right, with everything out of the way, let's start. I want to start with a simple dragon based on its boss fight, but he has one of the most unique dragon designs in the entire list. Gaping Dragon rarely gets the attention these days, but it is one of my favorite dragon fights in entire Souls genre. Gaping Dragon's lore is quite sad when you look at it. He is one of the oldest living creatures in Lordran. His story goes all the way back to the first ages. He is described as a descendant of a mineral-based life form, and while he is not entirely related to the arch dragons, his race has a distant relationship with them. Gaping Dragon lived through many ages, starting from the time of everlasting dragons all the way to the many ages of fire. Over time, Gwyn hunts down and executes every single one of the dragons. It comes to a point where Gaping Dragon becomes the only survivor of his race. He gives up on his pride and runs away to survive at all cost. He hides deep underground beneath Undead Berg, his hunger grows day by day, and his desire for more slowly begins to corrupt his mind and his body. This is where Gaping Dragon transforms into the beast he is. His corruption is quite a unique matter. To corrupt a human, first you must strip them of all their ambitions and then slowly take away their will to survive. But apparently it is quite the opposite for dragons. As Gaping Dragon devours anything in his path to survive, he becomes more and more corrupted and he loses himself over time. It comes to a point where his entire torso turns into a massive hole with sharp teeth and acid pouring out. He turns into a deformed monster who can only consume with no self-control over anything anymore. There's a popular theory that suggests Seed may have played a crucial role in Gaping Dragon's transformation, but that theory is based entirely on a channeler observing Gaping Dragon, so even though the idea of Seed doing more evil things is cool, sadly there isn't a lot of evidence to accept this theory, but it would be cool if Seed was responsible of Gaping Dragon's corruption. I don't want to talk too much about this one particular dragon, since there are so many fancy dragons waiting on the list, so I will keep this part as short as possible. For me, most of the charm of Gaping Dragon comes from nostalgia, and this is why I decided to put him so low on the list. As much as I enjoy the fight, I'm not delusional, so I don't really want to give him too much credit. Gaping Dragon has a decent area and an amazing atmosphere. He lives in the sewers and survives by consuming the waste of humans and lords. Once a mighty dragon who was part of a race ruled the world for ages, now hides in the low of the places and survives at all cost. In terms of his arena design, it doesn't look anything extreme but it fits perfectly to the lore of Gaping Dragon. His boss fight itself is nothing crazy, however it is a great skill check early on in the game. After Taurus Demon, Gargoyles and Capra Demon, Gaping Dragon stands as the first major enemy with a massive health bar and intimidating attacks. The reason why I put him at the bottom of my list is the inconsistency of his balance. If you decide to face Gaping Dragon head-on, his fight is an absolute nightmare. He has grab attacks, swipe attacks, some kicking combos and a head bump. So basically he has a lot of different, difficult, hard-hitting and intimidating attacks. And if players were forced to fight him like this, Gaping Dragon would be the hardest early to mid-game boss in the entire game. But what kills the flow of his boss fight is the fact that he can barely deal with the enemies flanking him. As long as you stay behind him, he doesn't have a lot of options. He has a tail swipe, which can be completely stopped if you just cut the tail. If you're on the sides, he charges forward to hit you with his legs but just don't stay in the way and those hits will never connect. It is just criminally easy if you want to cheese it. Overall, Gaping Dragon has an amazing design, an interesting tragic background, a decent arena and a partially amazing moveset, but despite all this, his difficulty can be so easily bypassed. Overall, this is a great, fun and unique dragon, but it comes a bit short when compared to the other dragons on the list. But once again, as an early game encounter, this is one of the best dragon fights in Dark Souls 1. 
I will never get tired of saying this, Dark Souls 2 has some of the best arenas and lore among all From Software games. This next dragon was my all time favorite for a good while. I really wanted to put him high in the list, but fighting him again for the video made me realize there are just much better dragons. This dragon's story starts with a mighty kingdom and a lord that expands throughout the game. It all began when the Rat King struck an agreement with a human chieftain. They came to an agreement that humanity would rule anywhere sun rays touched, and rats would rule over the dark depths of the underground. But humankind was nothing more than fools, liars and cheaters. They didn't honor their words and as soon as the balance of power shifted, they invaded the underground and stole lands of the rats. When humans discovered a sleeping dragon, they were quickly mesmerized by its beauty. In no time, a distant underground city was founded around the sleeping dragon. Sunken King wasn't a follower of the gods and lords of Anorlondo, instead he picked Sin as his deity and the entire kingdom worshipped Sleeping Dragon. Dragon Sanctum was built so that the entire kingdom could watch over the dragon. Kingdom's future was bright, their god was at the heart of their city and there were no rival factions that possessed any threat to the distant location. Kingdom was growing and expanding rapidly. One day Sunken King met a lone explorer known by the name Elena. She was one of the fragments of Manus. There's no clear source to Elena's motivation. It isn't clear whether she loved Sunken King or planned to betray him, but it is known that Elena was a fragment that represented Wrath of Manus. With Elena's arrival, city developed even further. Sanctum priestesses were tasked with comforting dragon with their suiting melody, but it all came to a devastating end with a tragic turn of events. Sir Yorg and his legion of Drakeblood knights launched the surprise invasion on Shulwa. Their goal was to slay the dragon and harvest its powerful blood. Shulwa was a peaceful city, away from horrors of the world. Sanctum guardians tried their best to hold back Drakeblood knights, but they failed miserably. With the king slain, there was no one left to stop the invaders. Sir Yorg found the dragon and impaled it with its spear, but Sin was too powerful. Impact of the spear awakened slumbering dragon, and in an instant Sin released all the poison it had been holding back all this time. Entire city was covered in toxic gases. Sir York died instantly, and soon the entire city was wiped out. Sin poisoned and killed every single one of his worshippers. It was the sunken city's tragedy. Its inhabitants were slain by their god, only to be resurrected resurrected and killed by the poison again and again until their god was killed by someone. When it comes to the boss fight, Sin is such a unique one. If he was a Dark Souls tree or Elden Ring boss, I would absolutely hate him, but he fits perfectly to Dark Souls 2's charm. A petrified dragon sleeping at the depths of earth. Overall, Sin is a perfect dragon fight. He is much more aggressive and hostile than many other bosses in the game, and he is always on the attack. As the fight goes on, he spits poison clouds to cover the arena and he puts more and more pressure on the player as the fight continues. Based on his boss fight, I can say that Sin was more of an experiment for From Software and judging by the newer dragons, this experiment definitely paid off. All the other dragons that came after him are straight up upgrades and improvements on the foundations, but when I think of the boss fight, there's only one issue that comes to my mind, and it is just how much time he spends on air flying. If you don't like bosses that are moving around too much and forcing you to chase them, you will most likely hate Sin, but overall From Software DLCs never disappoint, and Sin is a perfect dragon that made Dark Souls do infinitely better for me. Think of a dragon who was so powerful among its race that he was known as the Mighty Boulder Stone. In absence of Placidus Axe, Fortis Axe was known as the mightiest of the dragons, feared in all of lands between. After Placidus Axe disappeared, other ancient dragons were abandoned in a world that was burning in chaos. Mere mortals down below Pharaoh Mazula waged war on each other to become the gods of the new world. Without Placidus Axe ruling the world, insignificant 
humankind below saw themselves fit to rule. Over time, Godfrey became the first Elden Lord, but his title was nothing more than a lie. Somewhere out there, true Elden Lord was waiting for his time. Dragons saw Golden Order as invaders under the command of Grand Sex, Forty Sex, and Land Sex. Dragons waged war on Capital City. It was the first time ever in the history of Landel that the walls were breached by invaders. Without Placido Sex, though, dragons were far from their true strength. But this didn't hold them back. Forty Sex challenged Godwin the Golden. After all, this so called demigod had to prove himself to dragons. After a fierce battle, Godwin came victorious, but their brutal duel formed a bond between them. Godwin befriended Forty Sex, and they became the foundations of the Golden Age of Landel. Peace persisted until the Night of the Black Knives. Godwin was the first to die, but Forty Sex ventured deep within the soul of Godwin to bring him back to life. There he fought against death for many ages, but eventually he was consumed by the dead blight. He became the Lich Dragon. He failed to save his companion and lost himself to corruption. But even after all that, he not only preserved his power, but he also learned to conjure cursed lightning storms no one else could. Well, also his boss fight has a unique thing going on with him. I can't resurrect him for some reason, so I have to go through another new game cycle anytime I need a 40 sex footage, so thanks I guess. Okay, let's talk about the boss fight though. 40 sex is difficult to rank for me. I mean, I absolutely love his design and his attacks. I even like some of his aspects more than the other bosses that I placed higher, but still, there are some things that just kill the flow of his fight for me. Forty Sex has some of the greatest boss arenas for a dragon. You face the mightiest of the dragons in a dying realm. He is fast, deadly and wild. His fight perfectly combines different movesets. He uses the red lightning of the ancient dragons. He uses the golden lightning of Radagon infused with death. He also has deadly fire breath. Basically, he does a bit of everything. As I said, I like his design more than the other dragons, but there's reason why I don't place him above the remaining dragons. I'm not the biggest fan of fighting a boss's feet. It is not a great experience when you spend all the time looking at a single part of the boss. And this is one issue I have with 40 sex. Unless you are ranged, all you can focus is his legs. His head is so high up that let alone hitting it, you probably won't even be able to see it most of the time. For example, Mirir by scale is a much bigger dragon, but even against a much larger dragon, you can always get a better camera angle. Overall, 40 Sex is a great fight with amazing visuals, amazing arena, amazing atmosphere, but the targeting is not as satisfying as the rest of his boss fight. When there's an enemy too fierce and powerful for the gods living in Anno Londo, there's only one way to beat it. Hide in your fancy palace, send a knight or two on a suicide mission, and hope that chosen undead from the future will time travel and beat it for you. Well, if it isn't clear enough, this part is about Black Dragon Calamite. Calamite is the last of the ancient dragons, and he may even be the mightiest of all dragons that existed. All the ancient dragons that came before him were weak to lightning, but Calamite evolved in different ways. He was so powerful that the strongest firestorms of the witches were useless against him. Mere weapons couldn't even scratch, and the great lightning bolts of the sun god failed to peel his skin. Unlike his kin, Calamite had no weaknesses. While other dragons hid from the gods, Calamite ruled the skies with all of his glory. Knowing the armies that ended the Age of Dragons were weak and the Dragon Slayers were disbanded, Calamite quite literally had no rivals. He eventually moved to Ulusil. It was a perfect home for the Black Dragon. The entire kingdom was destroyed by Manus, and Lords of Anolondo were so afraid of the dark that they could never dare to invade this ruined kingdom. After all, a beast of abyss was corrupting the earth from within and Calamite was patrolling in the skies. These two beasts never made an alliance, but together their existence was a nightmare for Anna Londo. There's no clear evidence that Calamite was ever corrupted by the darkness, but just like abyssal sorceries, Calamite's flames deal both fire and physical damage. Once again, it is just a theory, but there's a high possibility that Calamite either consumed the dark or he was corrupted by it. When it comes to Calamite's boss fight, he was way ahead of his time. Its design, its movement, everything feels so smooth throughout the fight with barely any issues.
use. To initiate the boss fight properly, you have to talk to Go and convince him to wound Calamite. Otherwise, he will just fly over the boss area the entire time and he will just rain fire from a bow. It is not impossible to beat him in this phase, but it is just wrong and it is a terrible fight, so just don't even try. So once you have him wounded, Calamite will meet you at the bottom of the alley. With a single glowing eye, black scales and spikes coming out of his back, he's an intimidating sight from the very first second. For me, there's one thing Calamite does better than any other dragon in From Software games, and it is how easily he swaps between different combos. Now, his AI is nothing extreme. Most of his attacks depend on the distance between himself and the player, but where Calamite shines is that he can instantly swap between claw attacks and fire breaths. Most of the newer bosses also have a combination of physical, ranged and elemental attacks, but it always feels like these new bosses stop and consider their options for a moment before they swap attacks. Calamite on the other hand will swipe his tail and then he will instantly start flying and rain down fire, then he will launch forward, create distance and instantly trigger one of his many fire breath attacks. Despite the Age of Dark Souls 1, Calamite's boss fight still feels fresh and up to date. Another thing I really love about Calamite is how unique his powers are. His flame attacks also contain darkness within and they deal physical damage along with fire damage. He does more poise damage than any other boss in Dark Souls 1 and he has one of the best grab attacks in the entire game. His signature move allows him to use high frequency noises to levitate enemies around him. This attack by itself has multiple effects. It will leave a mark on you which will then make you receive twice as much damage and the other debuff is that if you're fighting him with a headphone, you will lose your ability to hear anything for the next 4 business days. Overall amazing boss fight, doesn't have the greatest arena and his charge and flying attacks can be a bit annoying at times but the fact that he can swap between so many different attacks seamlessly makes him an amazing dragon. Before the age of the Earth Tree, dragons ruled the world. During this period, humans were still primal barbarians and Marika was still in the land of shadows. An immortal dragon with five heads. Okay, wait. I feel like I need to point this out to prevent a full-scale war in the comment section. Old Lord's Talisman has four heads, but in-game model of Placidus X has three stumps and two heads. So there's no need to fight over how many heads they have. Like four heads, five heads, who cares? Actually, go ahead and fight. Anyways, I was saying, an immortal dragon with many heads ruled the world as a vassal of their outer god. It isn't really known whether Placidus X was the first of the immortal dragons or he was part of a long lineage of everlasting dragons, but it is known for sure that Placidus X is a hermaphrodite. Having both male and female heads, it is possible that Placidus X may have created many of the ancient dragons of Faramazula. So, I guess we also have inbreeding dragons in Elden Ring. Now. Placidus X was the first true Elden Lord, but their god abandoned them. Greater Veil in Elden Ring works in mysterious ways. It abandons its vassals when it feels like it. With Merica setting foot in the lands between, there was no more use for Placidus X. So, while Placidus was happily waiting in his chamber, their god left to grab some milk only to never return again. Placidus X lost his purpose and his title, and from the royal city in the skies, he observed puny humans fighting for the title, but Dragonlord was no warmonger. After being abandoned, they retreated to the heart of the royal city of Faramazula. There, Placidus X put themselves to rest until the day their god would return. The eternal dragon locked himself out of time and granted mankind a chance to start their own civilization. Placidus X is almost a masterpiece. I only put him in the second spot because there are some things about his boss fight that don't really click with me. Though anytime I slightly criticize a boss, I get the reaction, how dare you say anything bad about my favorite boss, you have to praise him without pointing out any flaws. Well, little Timmy, that's not how we do it here. As much as I praise the bosses, I also have to talk about their flaws. Now, what I think Placidus X did great is, first of all, they are by far the most cinematic dragon from software has ever made. You are fighting a godly dragon within a hurricane out of time. In terms of a boss setting, it really doesn't get cooler than this. Their attacks, effects, animations, and fighting style, everything is so smooth and satisfying. When they start flying in the air and their bodies turn into a storm cloud, when they nuke the area so 
so hard that even the soundtrack stopped. Everything in their fight is just perfect. But why did I not put him in the first spot then? Well, the thing I don't really like about them is how well behaved and calm they are. In From Software games, I enjoy wild, brutal dragons more than the wise ones. And Placidus Eggs always gave me the impression that they were just an old guy sitting there and doing their best to get you out of their lawn. Surely there's a reason behind it. Their bodies are full of scars, most of their heads are missing, and you face them at their lowest point. They were abandoned by their god, they are old and exhausted, so it makes sense that Placidus X fights slower. But still, I always say this and I will say it again, From Software went a bit too far with you fight a boss way past their prime. This time, I mean all the dragons and all the bosses are crippled to an extent and they all have things that are setting them back. But Placidus sex is nerfed way too much in my opinion, and essentially my only complaint about them is that they are a bit easier than I enjoy. Placidus X does everything right, overall he is an amazing boss but lacks a bit on the difficulty side. But I know I'm in a minority with this opinion, so what do you think about Placidus X and their difficulty? To talk about the background of Midir, I have to talk about the story of Lordran and the gods, but I did it before in two different videos, or maybe three videos, I don't know, so I will keep it really short this time. Quickly summarizing, Gwyn and the lords were living down below the surface, there Gwyn found a really powerful soul. Under his command, Lords eventually built a kingdom, he teamed up with Nito and Wish of Isolid, and then he forced Pygmies to fight by their side, they went to the surface, they lost a bunch of battles, and then Seed the Scaleless betrayed the dragons and revealed the weaknesses of his race, and later Gwyn, along with the other lords, exploited this weakness, which led to the end of the Age of Dragons, and then Gwyn took over the world and became the god of sunlight. This is pretty much the shortest summary I could come up with, but if you want to learn more about it, I guess you can go to Villains of Souls video or Tragedy of Souls video, but not yet, first finish this one. So we know the story, but where does Mirror come in? Well, Gwyn exiles the pygmies to the end of the world and traps them in a prison city, and this prison naturally needs a guard. This is exactly where Mirror comes in. After a war against dragons, gods kill every single one of the dragons they find. They even turn it into a sport, but for some reason when they find the dragon egg, they decide to keep it rather than destroying it, which in the long run possibly saves them more than they would like to admit. God Gods raise Midir and basically turn him into a mindless murder machine. There's one thing gods fear more than demons and dragons, it is darkness. So gods train Midir to fight darkness and anything that dares to crawl out of the abyss. During the peak of Anor Londo, gods successfully destroyed multiple human kingdoms that were corrupted by the dark. To prevent Ring City from also corrupting, they assign Midir to an eternal duty. Midir patrols over the Ring City day and night to devour anything that is exposed to the darkness. Ages later, gods of Anor Londo disappear without a trace, some can't be found anywhere, and some are simply dead. But even after his masters disappear, Midir never leaves his duty, and he devours the the spawns of the abyss for ages until he is eventually overwhelmed by the dark. He has underdeveloped small eyes due to living in the dark for thousands of years and his body is full of scars due to the unending exposure to the dark. When it comes to the boss fight, I can see why some people would put Midir behind Placidus eggs, but for me Midir has no competition. Midir is a fierce, ferocious murder machine. He is so full of fury and his attacks are so brutal that throughout the fight as he does some certain attacks, you can see that he exhausts himself and he fights at the cost of his own body. I just love how brutal and intimidating he is. But still, there's one complaint I hear so much about Midir, and it is his movement during the boss fight. I hear all the time people are saying how much he runs away and you have to constantly chase him. Back then I had the same opinion, I hated how much he was moving around, but eventually I came to a realization that if you fight him the intended way, he won't actually move around all that much. Surely if you try to go behind him or sneak under his legs, he will start moving away, but once you start fighting Midir head on, 
on. As long as you stay in front of him and go for the head, he barely moves away and you barely need to chase him. When it comes to his design, Midia's look fits perfectly to his background. Small underdeveloped eyes due to spending ages in the dark, torn wings and deformed features after exposure to the abyss, brutally unstable mind as a result of consuming the very thing that corrupts even the gods. For me, Midir is a perfect dragon with amazing visuals and an amazing build up before the boss fight. I know From Software will eventually make a dragon fight that will surpass Midir, but until then he is my all time favorite dragon. So if Shadow of the Earth Tree comes with an even better dragon, I will be both sad and extremely happy to see it. Well, if you made it this far, thanks a bunch. This is all for today, but if you enjoy awesome lore content, consider giving a like and subscribe. As always, thank you for your time and I will see you on the next one. Bye.